hope I never, I hope I'm never accused of making quote unquote adult movies. Steven Spielberg. The big trick will be how many, you know, personal pictures can get made within the system in Hollywood. Martin Scorsese. Most people are shocked when they realize that movies disappear. George Lucas. Three great directors raise questions and hopes for the future of film. Three legendary directors join Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert to look at the future of the movies. That's right, it's not a real balcony, it's only a set. And on this special program, Gene and I have gone behind the scenes to talk about the future of the movies. We visited three of America's best and most innovative directors to ask them to look into their crystal balls to predict what the future holds for themselves, for their movies, and for movie going in general. We also asked about the future of old movies. How will they be preserved and seen in the future? I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. I began our look into the future by talking with the most successful director of our time, of all time, Steven Spielberg, Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, E.T., Raiders of the Lost Ark, towering entertainments, every one. Spielberg, 42 years old, has been described as the poet of suburbia, and he works in a suburban palace. His Amblin Entertainment office building on the Universal Pictures lot in Southern California is a massive southwestern-style home, complete with a game room, country kitchen, and state-of-the-art screening room. I traveled out to the Skywalker Ranch, north of San Francisco, where 46-year-old George Lucas has developed one of the world's most advanced centers for film and video research and development. Paid for by the profits from the Star Wars bonanza, this state-of-the-art facility in the coincidentally named Lucas Valley it's where special effects technicians, computer programmers, and audio and video inventors are finding ways to make a movie out of almost anything that George Lucas or anybody else can dream up. Not many people who saw the movie The Abyss, for example, had any idea that this creature, which seemed to be made entirely of water, was actually made entirely out of a computer program and laser technology made by wizards working for Lucas at his industrial light and magic company. Finally, we both went to talk to Martin Scorsese, widely acknowledged by critics and his fellow directors as the greatest film artist of his generation. Scorsese, 47, is the director of Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, Mean Streets, and he is most comfortable on the Mean Streets of New York City. Alone of these three directors, he has appeared in his own films. His biggest role, a disturbed passenger in the backseat of Robert De Niro's cab, in taxi driver. Did I tell you to put, did I do did I tell you to do that with the meter? Put the meter back. Let the numbers go on. I don't care what I have to pay. We, I didn't I'm not getting out. We talked to Scorsese in the Times Square office building where he works. We first wanted to know from each of these directors what their immediate future would be like in the 1990s. You're going to get this question to you drop uh, the ET sequel. Mm -hmm. In the 90s? No. Go further. 2010? No. <laughs> 2020? No. <laughs> no. And just so people understand, when you say no, you're saying no to probably hundreds of millions of dollars. You yes. know that. Yeah. It ended. It was a wonderful love affair. And then it was over. And then Elliot went back to his life, and E.T. went back to his planet. There's, there's no going back. There's nothing more to say. I said it all. If I, but with Raiders, I had an appetite, as George did. For more adventure and i still have an appetite to make adventure movies not the raiders type of films but i still want to do adventure films in my career what have you seen that you said this could be let's just be speculative this could be a this could be a feature film are there something that i've been noodling around this is uh, possible well i'm, I'm i mean it's, it's it's no secret that i'm i'm interested in a biography on howard hughes he was really a, a just a complete contradiction uh, he was a movie producer you know, he was a megalomaniac. He, he had his, he was interested in airplanes. You know, I have a love affair with airplanes ad nauseum. 
as 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 did Hughes, and 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 uh, there are many different, and also that he became completely reclusive, and uh, existed in kind of an inner world, and he was at one point in his life for several decades the most gregarious person, and then the following several decades the most uh, infamously reclusive personality uh, that's ever been talked about in American history and it were 20th century history and I just find that very fascinating it's been about seven years since the last uh, Star Wars movie yeah 83 was it yeah 83 yeah I understand that you're finally going <laughs> to go back into that universe yeah I've been um, obviously I have these these stories and um, I've been trying to figure out a time when I'm going to devote, you know, a serious amount of time to, to bringing these next three stories to the screen. When you started on the Star Wars saga, you had nine stories all together in your mind. No, when I, what really happened was, is I wrote a screenplay. Mm -hmm. The screenplay was way too big, you know. And so what I decided to do was take the first act of that screenplay and make it into a movie. And so I, that's what I did with Star Wars. But Star Wars, Empire, and Jedi are really four, five, and six. Yeah. And you're now thinking of doing one, two, one, two and three. Yeah, because I have all the information on that, and it's sort of the stories. I know the stories. And Do they take place in the lifespan of the, earlier in the lifespan of the characters in four, five, and six? Or Yeah. It's really about, uh, uh, you know, um, Obi-Wan Kenobi as a boy. and uh, I can't imagine him as a boy. Yeah, well, he was a boy, and so was, <laughs> uh, you know, so was... Uh, uh, Anakin Skywalker, mm -hmm. and uh, who became Darth Vader eventually, and um, you know it's those characters, and how they ended up getting where they were. In terms of genres, in your future, what haven't you done that is on your checklist? Romance. <laughs> <laughs> well, an unhappy romance, but it's a romance. <laughs> so, unrequited love. You, there's unrequited love throughout all your pictures. There's unrequited love. Well, this will have costumes. <laughs> 1870s. Really? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. It's a nice project. I hope, I hope to do it um, in a couple of years. Actually, the first film by any one of these three directors in the 90s will be Scorsese's Goodfellas, a look at three generations in the mafia. You're getting a rare glimpse at a work print of this movie, which will come out later this year. And in this scene, Scorsese's mother, Catherine, plays the mother of mobster Joe Pesci, who has brought friends Robert De Niro and Ray Liotta to his house following a murder. Tonight we were out late, we took a ride on the, out to the country, and we hit one of those deers. That's where the blood came from, I told you. Jimmy told you before, I'm not saying. Anyway, you know what reminds me, I need this knife. I'm gonna take this, it's okay? Okay, yeah, I just need it for bring it back, though, you know. Critical success has rarely been a problem for Martin Scorsese, but commercial success has been a problem. I really hope one day, maybe in this decade, to have one of my pictures make a lot of money. That'd be great. You know, that would be a different genre. That would be a different genre, a picture that makes a lot of money. <laughs> some, they make some money, they make some, but not, not, not to the, these figures are amazing, aren't they? Pictures come out, and money makes really, 160 million, they get upset. If you, were, <laughs> if you were looking at the way movies are going, though, in terms of the, the so-called home run picture, the $200 million picture. Yeah, these things are amazing. The $300 million yeah. picture. Do you think that's bad? Is that going to be bad in the next 10 years, that so many studios seem to be swinging for the fences? It, I think it could be, I think it could be, uh, it's difficult. And that's why I think, in a way, I would need some names to help, to help get certain, certain, certain kinds of stories I want made. <clears throat> because the stories are no way, uh, in the studio's eyes, uh, no way going to uh, go for that, aim for that, that, uh, that uh, level of $200 million uh, receipts. For George Lucas, the problem isn't how much his movies might make, but how much they might cost. The costs of doing these kind of mo movies have just gone completely through the roof. I mean, uh, if I were to try to do uh, a Return of the Jedi today, using the same technology and the same techniques uh, that I used, you know, seven years ago, but to do that movie today would cost, I would say, at least seventy-five million dollars. You're kidding. Yeah. Even, but, but yet, in seven years, there's been so much advance in the in the computer technology and in the other. Well, the, when you made that, Star Wars, the first picture, the the personal computer didn't exist. But the thing of it is that the, yeah, the, um, that computer technology isn't really to a point now where it's cost effective. And I would say within five years, uh, the computer technology will be cheaper than the old fashioned one. It's amusing because people are so uh, willing to casually say, oh, it's all done on computers. Whatever you're talking about, people say, oh, it's all done on computers these days. 
And it isn't all done on computers yet. No. I've, believe me, I've been involved in a lot of state-of-the-art computer technology, and then you'd be surprised what they can't do. <laughs> the, we got a ways to go. They will be able to do it, so but they can't do it right now. A long time ago, you once told me, speaking of George Lucas, you said, someday we'll all be working for George. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's more likely, I think, that someday everyone will be working for you. Well, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is, as a producer, no, not really, because I'm not really interested. If that were true, I'd be running a studio by now. You've had the offers. I've had, oh, oh yeah, yes, many times to, to really, you know, run, run a movie studio and make 18 to 25 films a year. And I just, I just don't want to do that. Because? Because how do you be attentive to 18 to 25 movies a year? It's a business. And sometimes you have to make movies you don't want to make to fill the bill. And it's a terrible way to, you know, to get through your creative life anyway. Now you're 42 years old. Are you going to grow up? in the 90s? I don't know. I mean, I mean, uh, I don't, I'm not, not going to say I hope so. I mean, I'm not looking to grow up in the 90s. I'm not making a conscious effort to grow up in the 90s. I'm, I think I'm changing all the time, but I also think that, that I'm not going to know really who I am through my movies until I've made a lot more films and can look back and say either I grew up or I never grew up. That's not my problem. Then what is? I don't have any problems in that way, in that regard. My problem is finding good stories. From my own imagination, it's not, you know, it's never been easy. You know, I talk to producers on Broadway, you know, in the old days, you know. We've got to have a show. We've got to have a show. You know, pacing. You know, smoke coming out of their feet as they pace hours in a hotel room trying to think of a show. It's the age-old problem, you know. You know, what do we do to entertain you next? What do we do to entertain ourselves next? MGM Studios Theme Park with Star Tour. The Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular and The Muppets. The Walt Disney World Resort in Florida. What a year to be here. Continuing our special show on the future of the movies, we were fascinated to discover the frustrations that directors Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, and George Lucas have had. Frustrations that will color the pictures they make from now on. For example, over the years of their separate successes, each has been intrigued by the challenge of whether he could ever make a movie in the style of the others. Your first two features, uh, THX 1138 and American Graffiti, were what could be called personal films. Well, THX especially was a, was, it was a personal film in, a, in that that was the kind of movie making I liked to do and was doing at the time. I really saw myself when I got out of school as being a cinema verite documentary filmmaker who, on the side, was able to make these sort of personal movies, visual films. That was the closest thing. That was sort of my taking my personal kind of vision and trying to translate it to the theatrical medium. And um, you know, with dubious success, but it was an interesting experiment. Uh, American Graffiti, on the other hand, was uh, a regular movie where there are a lot of human beings and actors and they act and it's funny and it's like a real movie. So that was a challenge there. And I obviously took something out of my past and I made something that, that I cared about. But it was in a way part of it was a challenge to sort of learn theatrical filmmaking. I was going to say American Graffiti is a film that is a starting point for a career that you haven't had yet. Pretty much. A different career as a different filmmaker. Yeah. Well, and it's, well, I mean, I, my career has just sort of gone sideways. I, you know, I don't know why, other than I did what I seemed to be right at the moment and mm -hmm. seemed to be the thing I needed to do. And a lot of my friends at the time after Star Wars were saying, you know, why don't you do a movie like Taxi Driver? Why don't you do some artistic statement? Why are you making children's films? I mean, this is completely lunatic. And I said, well, I, I want to do it. You know, you get people who like your work and want you to, be, a be somebody else. So a lot of people like my work, and they say, now can you be somebody different? I say, what's wrong with me? They say, we like all your films now, 
but you're trying to repeat yourself and getting a little tired of this, of this of this sweet stuff. Why don't you be somebody else? And make a real dark movie. Show us your dark side. You know. And um, to them in the '90s, they're not going to get it, right? Why well, I haven't shown myself my dark side yet. I mean, how am I going to show it to anybody else? We've all got them, but you know, we have to acknowledge them before we can make movies about them. Um, no, I mean, we all do different things. I could never make Raging Bull. I don't think Marty um, could, could have made, let's say, Close Encounters in the same way. He would have made a wonderful and interesting Close Encounters. I don't think I would have made a wonderful or interesting Raging Bull. Uh, you know, Marty likes primal life. He likes the primal screen. He's the best director of the primal scene in film history. You know, the primal screen scares the stuff out of me. What is it that somebody like uh, Spielberg has? I mean, he's the home run hitter of all time uh, of your age group. What does he have that you don't have in that way? Well, I really think he has a, uh, his hand uh, right on the pulse of, of what the public, not only what the public wants, but their fantasies, what they need. And what they needed in the early, uh, what, well, 75 was Jaws, but I'm talking about E.T. and Close Encounters in the late 70s, and that's what that fantasy, the sense of, the sense of wonder and that, sense of real theatrical magic. It's the kind of thing I want to see, you know, the kind of thing I grew up watching. The Disney, Disney, it's like Disney, really it had that. It was just so fascinating. I mean, it's the kind of picture I like to go in a theater and see and be in a wraparound screen, sit in the second row, but and have you, incredible sound, and it makes $200 million. It's terrific. You do know? you think you can make a picture like that, can I, do I don't know if I can. popular imagination? I don't know if I can, you see, that's the thing. I don't know if I, I like to watch them. Uh -huh. I don't think I can do it. You've talked about the aspirations of kids in your films. Mm -hmm to have a pet, an E.T., mm -hmm. um, to see a creature from another planet, Close Encounters, yeah. to survive a shark. Mm -hmm. What do 42-year-olds have fantasies about? Well, 42-year-olds dream about spaceships, shark survival, uh, you know, fedora hat and leather jacket escapades across the globe. You know, 42 years old, you know, 82 years old, doesn't matter what age you are, the child is still alive inside of you, even if you dwarf it by, um, just by sheer neglect. I want to ask that question again, because I don't know if you're giving me a really no. good answer, and that is, what do 42-year-olds fantasize about? Because I have a feeling that it is not uh, creatures from another planet. Well, well, the one thing we all have in common, that anybody, you see, a 42-year-old fantasizes about, um, you know, excitement and emotions, whether they're uplifting or they're going to, you know, going to put, put, put your feelings down. What about uh, the ultimate uh, sexual encounter, a, a truly close encounter? Moi? <laughs> to film that? <laughs> I've always been embarrassed by screen sexuality. It's always embarrassed me. Um, it's embarrassed me because it hasn't often been done real well. And when it has been done, it's, it's, it's been no different than the last couple of sexual encounters in other movies. And, and, and one of the most original sexual encounters was one of the most honest, which was in Nick Rogue's Don't Look Now. Um, there haven't been a lot of Don't Look Now since Don't Look Now. And uh, I also find that movies tend to stop for love scenes. That what is said between the people in daylight is often much more poignant and emotional and sensually suggestive than the arbitrary cutaway with the backlight coming through the window, you know, and, and the rolling in the hay. It, it just, you know, to me is, you know, there have been very few films that, where well, that's important. Now open God's... Nobody knows a director's work better than the director himself. And so we asked all three of our great American directors to choose what they think is the master image in their work. The one visual image or approach or style that best captures their whole artistic personality. For Martin Scorsese, it came from the movie many people think was the best film of the 1980s. To people that don't know you, there may be some, 
Uh, you once told me about this concept of the master image, of the single shot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of, that represents the whole film. You want to come up with a master image that would sum up you, uh, that you say, you know, if I started to take, started grabbing film out of your vault, you'd say, leave me this frame, because this is what I stand for. Ah, uh, well, I, uh, that's, that's a hard one. I, I, you know, I know I should say something witty, but I can't. <laughs> it's like I don't a, want you to say well, something witty. Well, I'd like well, you to pick. Right, or, you know, well, let's, a take, of a... let's take Raging Bull, because it was voted the best film of the 80s, and it's certainly one that you're pleased with. Well, I think the uh, opening title shot, the, the shot that's used over the titles, has, has that quality for me. sense of desolation, the sense of loneliness, and that, that sense of that ring being, uh, in a way, uh, no, not different from the kitchen or the bedroom or the living room or the street. Uh, that sense of loneliness and a sense of uh, isolation and fighting out your life, struggling to survive, you know, and struggling to be, you know, what you think may be a good person or a good man. I think for me, it's a, it's a pace and, a, and an editorial style more than it is an actual photographic image that is the essence of what I am. I've noticed that the one thing that I bring to the medium that is very unique to me is that sort of pace and editorial style, which is probably reflects my personality. It's hard to see. Can you give us a series of four shots that, that embody your pace and uh, editorial style? What, a series of shots? Yeah, that we'd have to have more than one shot if we are going to talk about pacing. Yes. I mean, the only thing that comes to mind is a very odd little sequence in Star Wars where they escape from the Death Star and they're, they're sort of a, you know, they're shooting the TIE fighters, they're in the, you know, when you talk, I mean, they're sort of in the gun ports, and that little gun port sequence is, uh, I think, an example of that. That's it! We did it! We did it! <laughs> This is real tough. I start throwing out all your films, mm -hmm. and you say, give me this one negative. Let me hold this one. Mm -hmm. What occurs to you? Well, that, that's, the, that's the best, maybe the hardest question to answer, because um, it's kind of like saying, you know, you know, which of your four kids do you like the most? You know, it's hard for a parent to answer that about when they have a lot of children. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. I think maybe the one image for me, I mean, you're, you're asking me the question, I feel obligated to give you an answer, so let me give you an answer, even if I take it back in my sleep tonight, okay? Fine. Um, I think it's the little boy in Close Encounters opening the door and standing in, the, in, in that beautiful yet awful light, just like fire coming through the doorway. basically a symbol of the human condition, that we're all boys or girls standing in front of a door at all times. That we don't know what's out there, and yet we should discover what's out there. We should be afraid of not knowing, and we should take a step toward what we don't understand. my microwave brownies. <laughs> Continuing our special show on the future of the movies, each of the directors we talked with was most concerned that Howie would remember and preserve its past in the future. According to Spielberg, Lucas, and Scorsese, film preservation is one of the most important issues for the 90s. 25 pounds. Wow. 
I don't pay that much for my, my Sunday britches. You're watching Becky Sharp, the first Technicolor feature film ever made. It doesn't look or sound very good after 55 years. So how do you turn this scratchy, faded, dirty old film into this? Well, I've spoken to him, and he thinks you'd make a very fine console at some distant spot. When? When? I thunder when? And how do you restore John Wayne to full living color in She Wore a Yellow Ribbon? But I know your performance under you. New Commander will make me proud of you. I've always been proud of you. The answer is restoration. And the restoring and preservation of classic movies is one of the great issues facing the motion picture business in the 90s. The two examples we showed you are from the amazing, important work being done at the UCLA Film and Television Archive. UCLA is at the forefront of work to save our film history, a subject that few people worried about until they began to notice that nitrate film, the kind of film once used for all movies, actually disintegrates with time. All three directors we spoke with have a big interest in film preservation. It's our heritage. It's, very, uh, it's a very valuable thing, and it's, it's a shame to see it sort of just drift away. I think, I, don't, I think most people are shocked when they realize that movies disappear that they just disappear, you know, and then somebody goes to look and they've heard about a movie and they discover that it doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. Most people are shocked to find out the movies even exist because they think that they're just there in the theater somehow. Yeah. They don't think that a Probably can not. is carried from the airplane by somebody. It's, it's insane. We have a, I mean, but it's very consistent with the American society, you know. We, we value the least those things which are the most meaningful to us or the most valuable to us in, in, in a real sense, you know, teachers, nurses, mothers, films. And as these films sit in their vaults, they rot, they fade, they shrink, and I'm talking about the negatives now. And I think I'd like to say to the executives, something I've been saying all along, that they've got to spend more time preserving their assets and, and saving their assets, so to speak. I thought you told me and Roger that uh, Jaws was not in good shape. In terrible shape. And we have just now, and we've been going all over the world looking for good prints that might have been misplaced when the film was first exhibited in Europe, let's say, in 1975. What happened? Just, uh, you know, bad storage, bad, pre bad preservation techniques. That's all there is to it. The Egyptians knew, but we don't know how to, they knew how to preserve their people 3,000 years ago. We don't know how to preserve our film. In, in the 90s, and, and, and uh, there are people who know how to do it. It's just it's going to take money and a commitment on the part of the, the owners, the corporations, to really want to save their films. One classic film that has been saved is Lawrence of Arabia, winner of seven of the ten Academy Awards it was nominated for in 1962. But after 20 years of shoddy re-editing and shockingly bad storage, this great film was just about ruined. However, through an incredible two-year project completed just last year, Lawrence was restored to its original design. The movie's director, David Lean, and star Peter O'Toole were among the many people brought back to re-record original dialogue and re-edit the film. Involved in the process of saving Lawrence and the leading proponent of film restoration is director Martin Scorsese. So this is the can <laughs> from the Columbia vault that they found when they went looking for Lawrence of Arabia. This is the condition that the film can was in. Well, of one, yeah. of the, one of the cans in the vault, yeah. and they were all in equally bad shape. Well, this, is, of course, is an extreme, you know, this is an extreme situation of 65 millimeter film, and it's, uh, you know, uh, this is what happens. Um, I mean, you have to understand, I mean, there was, a, there was a, a period, I think, in the late 60s and early 70s in Hollywood where uh, it was before video, and a lot of these things were um, lots of changes, lots of changes in studio heads and that sort of thing, administration, and uh, uh, the last thing in the world I could think of was uh, what was in the vault. What was in the vault uh, should be okay, you know? They're finding it out now, and they are becoming more aware of it, because not only with video on Laserdisc and uh, satellite soon, I mean, all of that, that uh, their vault is uh, really corporate assets. Their corporate assets is the most, Im if, not, if not the most important thing, what, the second most important thing. The first thing is, of course, the productions that they make that each year. Uh, what kind of thinking goes into this? Do they only think about new production, and they don't think about investment of capital in preservation of their, uh, of their assets, of their past? Well, it, the tradition in the film business is once you show the movie in the theater, then that's it. It's dead. 
you know, and then in the 50s, they began to realize that, they're, well, maybe it's not dead. Maybe if you put it on television, it might have another life. Mm -hmm. And then they said, fine, that's right, but then you sold the television rights and then it's dead and we don't worry about it anymore. And then all of a sudden, it's in a video cassette. And they say, well, it's not really dead now. Now we got, and slowly it's dawning on people that actually these films have a life. They can go on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And I'm real concerned that even though they say, don't worry, our films are preserved on videotape, well, videotape also falls apart. You know, they say, don't worry, we're, gonna, we're, pre we're, we're, we're preserved on disc. Well, disc can get ruined. You know, I think they've got to go back to the negative, which is, you know, um, uh, just short of the uh, inspiration, which is often, you know, a, 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 always a filmmaker, and, uh, you know, take those little nuggets and treat them like uh, antiquities. You know, treat them the way people run around you know, spending hundreds of millions of dollars buying French Impressionism. Let's treat our films like they're, they're art, works of art, and not just commodities to be rolled off and rolled off and rolled off until uh, someday in the future they'll be able to cut off the heads of the actors from the 90s and put on the heads of the popular actors from the 21st century. I mean, it is the end of the century now. It's the last decade. This is the art form of the century. It's American, you know. And uh, this whole hundred years is like a golden age. Forget the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. And, you know, oh, when we look back, people in the 50, in 2050 are going to look back and, and look back at this century as the golden age of cinema. Not only in America, but everywhere else. Certain kinds of films being made. And, and uh, we're the ones right now in Hollywood. We're the ones right now, uh, filmmakers and the studios and the archives. We're the ones who are going to get caught with the rap if we don't take care of them. <laughs> you know, they're going to say, why didn't they do anything about it? And we're they in that way. KMST Central Coast News Break. Here's Romney. Here's in Santa Cruz at six. Here's you might be trading in your old TV for a new set, high definition television. Television's new wave will feature a widescreen format and a picture more than twice as good as today's sets can provide. Add in a large screen, and in terms of picture impact, the home TV experience will approach even real movies in a theater. This is what your average television looks like, and the picture on it is made when lines of electronic information are sent back and forth across the screen. But even though the picture looks fine, there's something in it you can't see unless you get a close-up of the screen. There are lines of black in this picture, and they will someday be filled in to make a more clear, more perfect image. Along with that high-definition image, your television shape will change in the future to a widescreen format, a widescreen shape more like a movie theater screen. Experimental high-def televisions are on display around the world right now, and some of their screens are very large with very good images. If you add a good sound system, well, some people may never want to go to a movie theater again. And all of our directors are wondering what this new technology might mean for the art of film. HDTV really comes into this country, it's going to take this country by force. Uh, f first of all, uh, the people who can afford it will buy it, and later the sets will get cheaper, and, and that's going to compete theatrically, because the pictures are going to be as clear almost in your home as 35 millimeter movies. And that's when we might have to start thinking about a different kind of formatting of the motion picture experience. You know, larger theaters, bigger screens, uh, 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 first and foremost, better stories. If people begin to have high-definition television in their homes, so that they can look at a television picture or a home video or a movie of a, a video movie on a screen that is 10 feet wide. And they have surround sound, in fact, the home PHX surround sound system. Right. What, uh, if anything, are you going to do to encourage them to feel that they still have to go out of their home to see your movies in first run? Well, I think the marketplace will shift dramatically. In, in that situation. I think certain kinds of movies will be made directly for the home and certain kind of movies will be made for theater presentations. No matter how you get around it, the theater presentation is a group experience. And there is something very magical about a group experience that you cannot duplicate in the home unless you invite, you know, 500 of your closest friends in. Do you think in the age of high definition television that uh, theatrical movies will tend to be more spectacular or? 
I think the, the more, yeah, the larger, more spectacular ones will end up in the theaters and the more personal ones will end up on the screen. When you look at a high-def picture, what do you see when you see it on a movie screen and what do you see when you see it on a television screen with the director's eye? It looked pretty good to me. It looked pretty good. I mean, it just seems to me that it's a whole new modus operandi. You have to, the cinematographer is mainly in the van at the, and uh, you, there's, there's a great deal that goes on on the set that has to do with camaraderie between people and uh, just feeding off each other and uh, giving a glance uh, to your cameraman uh, when something beautiful is happening in a scene or you give each other a look and you know you got the take and, you know, it's that kind of thing that you need, uh, that I enjoy. I mean, if you can't enjoy it, uh, if you can't enjoy it with the people, that's a problem. And I have a feeling some of the technology may be taking away some of that, uh, uh, some of that closeness. But uh, again, I'm open to any of it because uh, it's exciting. You know, but you have to look 10, 20 years ahead and say, well, you know, I know for a fact that they will have video to the quality of, of the best uh, film that we have today. You know, it may not get up there with show scan or some of, some of the really uh, high-tech stuff, but, you know, the normal, you know, 35 millimeter image will definitely be uh, available on video, I think, before the 21st century. Will this take us finally to the vision that uh, Francis Coppola was drawing for me in 1967 when he opened up his briefcase and pulled out all of these catalogs and said, the day's going to come when every man can walk around with, with a motion picture studio on his shoulder. We have that today. The highest rated television show in America. <laughs> America's funniest home videos. You, that's it. Little and quality control is needed though. Quality control is a little shaky. <laughs> there, it's a short form right now, but hey, you know, that can, they can move that to a half an hour, they can move it to an hour, and then they can move it to two hours. But the issue really gets down to, in all of this, it's like writing. Anybody can write. Very few people can write well. When you see most people's home videos, mm -hmm. do you want to say to them, why don't you just do this? It would make your film so much easier. Don't frame them in the center. I try at almost all costs to avoid seeing people's home videos, Gene. And it's, I've been pretty good about avoiding it up to now. <laughs> but that is the mistake, right? Yeah. They frame everything dead center. I don't know if there's any mistake so much. I, it, I think the people video having a camcorder at home is just an extension of what they would choose to see. And people who are, I mean, I have seen a couple of videos, and let's say they go to Disneyland. Well, they're so excited about being on Disneyland, there's a lot of whip pans. There's, there's uh, four seconds of this, and quickly two seconds of this, and then right down to the child crying, and then back up to Mickey Mouse, and back down to the child screaming, and back up to Mickey Mouse, and back down to the child laughing, and back up to Mickey Mouse. I mean, it's just, you know, it's the appetite to get it all in during the vacation creates a lot of panic. That's mainly what I see when I see videos like that. And your advice would be, as you said to filmmakers... No, no, no. At home, my advice would be do anything you want. Just shoot from the heart. Don't listen to us. Just make your own movies. Grandpa, who would ever think that you are a party animal? <laughs> That'll teach him. You got a great product. It's all great party. Continuing our special show on the future of the movies, what will the movie-going experience be like in the theaters of the future? It will be a whole lot better than it is today, our directors hope, if audiences can become more active in demanding better treatment in movie theaters. Going to the movies, it's an experience everyone has shared, but it's not always as much fun these days as it used to be. It has its problems, which our directors believe could be solved in the 90s. They wish people would take more interest in how movie pictures and sound are delivered and can be improved. I would, I would certainly hope the theater owners um, take as much pride in exhibiting our films as we do in having made them. You know they don't. But if they did, then there would be... Uh, average of 15 to 17 foot Lamberts, which means the amount of light, a good, healthy amount of projection light onto the screen. And what is there in an average theater instead well, of 15 to 17? Six or seven sometimes. I mean, 
I mean, sometimes we actually have to anticipate where our films are being exhibited so we can put more light in the lab into our films. So when they show in theaters that customarily run films with very weak projector bulbs, you get to see the image on the screen. George Lucas, whose company developed the THX sound system, thinks people ought to check the equipment at their local theaters. Uh, we've discovered that twice as many people will go to a THX theater showing the same movie in the same city in the same quality theater. And it's just because they want it, they want the best possible presentation. People notice that. In other words, I they actually... People do notice it, and they will pay for it. Mm -hmm. They will go to, they will drive a, a further, they will drive out of one area into another area to get a high, higher quality presentation. We also wondered if any new equipment in the 90s might make their work easier or more innovative. Yeah, just um, a camera that uh, moves and glances the way I do, uh, the way I move my head. But it'd be, I think it'd be very nauseating for the audience because <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, you I want to move as fast as possible sometimes or walking through the streets here in New York or uh, the clarity with which you just move and see another image or another where you, where you, where you direct your glance. It's almost like uh, uh, it's never quite with the, the two gears on, on the camera. The, it's never quite accurate enough for me. It's never. That's one of the reasons I have with the, one of the problems with the Steadicam image, although I love and I've used it a number of times. But to use it all the time, it gives to me the edges of the frame are uh, always sh jiggling a little bit. It's kind of unsettling. It's insecure. and it, it's, un it's uncertain. But your uncertain. camera is almost always moving anyway. Even in shots that appear to be... To be where, even in I shots where the camera seems to be nailed down, if you look very carefully... There's always creeping or something. There's always some yeah, creeping going on in, every si in practically every yeah. single shot in all of your movies, which I think adds to the voyeuristic involvement of the audience because a movie camera, it seems to me, is always more more involving than a, than a stationary camera. Yeah, I can never really get as precise as, as precise as the way I want it, the way I, see, the way I see certain things occur. Is there an invention that you would like to see happen in the 90s that would help you make films better? Uh, no, no. I think, I think motion pictures are a very unique medium. Uh, film and cameras and everything we have right now is all we need. I really believe that. It's all we need. You know, um, I mean, can you invent a new kind of bat to hit a baseball further without cheating? Uh, um, you know, there are certain forms in our culture, and sports certainly, where the sport has been there for a long time. It doesn't need improvement. Um, I mean, football doesn't need, you know, a replay judge. I think that's a, a, a real burden of technology uh, on, on human errors and, ju and judgment calls, whether they're, whether they're right or wrong. But films have a camera. We've got, a, got the lab, the process of film. We've got the lights. We've got the sound. No, I think it, we've got all we need. George Lucas thinks differently. We're just on the very leading edge of, of the whole technology. Whereas with, you know, running cellular through gears, which is really, in the end, a 19th century idea, and that's 19th century technology, um, I think that they pretty much pushed that to the limit. I don't see that going much further. In the last analysis, none of these directors think that anything will ever replace going to see the movies in a real movie theater. I think because of the way we are, I mean, the human beings, there still has to be, and there still will be room for pictures that will be a communal experience. Uh, and maybe these will be the ones that make uh, eight or nine years from now $300 million or something, and maybe it'd be more like uh, Steve and George, George's films. I don't know. And yet, uh, uh, I really think that that's part of the, uh, why do people still go to plays? Why do they go see Les Miserables or, or, you know, Phantom of the Opera? They like to get out of the house. For yeah. One thing. Kids want to get out of the house. Yeah. Spielberg provides a case in point by describing the first time he showed E.T. to his son. How did you show him the film? This might be interesting for people at home. They would think normally you'd just slip in a cassette. I have a feeling you showed it to him in a screening room. In perfect projection with perfect sound. 166 aspect ratio, of course. Yeah, I wouldn't let him see it on video. Because? Well, because there's, there's an experience uh, about sitting in a room, albeit maybe alone, years after the film had its theatrical, you know, run, but seeing a large image, uh, direct, you know, light through the celluloid, projecting like a slideshow in movement against a, a screen with good sound and 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 uh, the smell of popcorn. It's it's exciting. It's theatrical. It's showmanship. I mean, movies are showmanship. When movies go on to videotape, and I love the the idea that people still see our films in all different forms, but the showmanship is missing once you look at a movie at home. 
it's not the same. It's not the same. Even in an intimate film, it's not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. It'll never be the same. Seventy. There is one issue that is going to link all three of these directors in the 1990s. They have announced the formation of an organization called the Film Foundation for Film Preservation. And all three have banded together. They have roped in some other directors. They're going to be going out and hitting up the studios for millions of dollars of money mm -hmm. to make sure that the past is preserved in the future. And that's a great development. And you know, it's funny that it would take somebody like that to tell the studios, look, this is your wealth. This is what makes this studio more than just real estate or all these cans of film down in the basement that have been neglected for so long. But that, to me, is the theme of this whole show, which is that in the old days, the golden age of Hollywood, the studio is a repository of research and development and technique. And a director would go in, and there was the, the special effects team. And there was the optical printer team. And there were the people who would do the mat shots and so forth. Right. Today, a director, and it's particularly true of these three directors, has to be an expert on all of those areas. And these guys, particularly Lucas up in his uh, Skywalker Ranch, mm -hmm. are financing their own research and development. They're inventing new tools in order to help them make the movies they want to make. Well, they've also made movies that, that we all want to see. Now, all these pictures are available on home video that they've That's made. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a question. Go director by director and say, what would you recommend to people that they rent for each of the three guys? If they only had to rent one film? Well, with Lucas, I would just go right ahead and I would rent Star Wars because that is the, the central film, I think, of his saga. With Scorsese, it would be Raging Bull. And uh, with Spielberg, it'll be E.T. Well, I'm going to pick some odd choices that people might not think about. For uh, Lucas, I think that his best film remains American Graffiti. Mm -hmm. And it's a picture that's more than just a joyride. It's a great celebration, one long night. It changed the way movie music was used. And I think it's a fabulous film. Uh, my favorite uh, uh, Spielberg picture is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Mm -hmm. He told me that he doesn't like the version where he went back into the ship, but that was the only way he could do some earlier he editing. He doesn't like the expanded version. No, he doesn't. Yeah. Uh, he thinks that it should end going to the ship so yeah. maybe the original version or or stop your projector your video vcr when it gets to the inside mm -hmm. of the ship in the expanded mm -hmm. version and uh for spielberg uh, for uh, martin scorsese um i think that mean streets is a remarkable effort made in 1973 you'll see the guts now of the do guy do you there. think that those three films are the best three films by those directors i did say that it is for uh, uh spielberg i believe close encounters is his best and uh i believe yes it is lucas's best mm -hmm. uh american graffiti and Mean Streets is certainly as good as anything that uh, You know, one thing I think done. we would both agree on is that you can hardly find a bad film for many of these guys to rent. I mean, they're really pretty good directors. And I'm Roger Ebert. I'm Gene Sisko. Thanks for watching.